using my empathy voice because I'm a designer, I'm a, as a design professional, I'm ethically, uh, I'm expected, the expectations of the design profession is that I do my best to uh, imagine what it's like to be a student or a client. And the second thing, which seems to contradict the first thing, I understand that I, I'm not, I, I can never fully understand what it's like to be a student or a client. So I'm curious. So I'm curious. We, we are curious. We have asked. Some students have said, you know, when you ask us at the beginning of class for target questions that you need us to hit uh, to feel a sense of completion in your education. Um, some of you are not comfortable shouting out a question and having us write it down. So we're going to do it this way. Please anonymously use this QR code to put up a uh, question. And for this, uh, we do invite you to use your phone uh, devices. Any questions about that? So what questions do you need us? What burning questions are, are you left with? after the experience of these readings and the discussion questions, that you most urgently must help have our help to figure out in order to feel like you've got an understanding, in order to make sense of what we're talking about this week, which is capitalism as an uh, operating system uh, that has produced architecture, produced our city, <clears throat> and continues to produce our cities with significant impacts on the cities we produce. Capitalism is an operating system, leaves its mark on everything. And if, if we don't acknowledge that, we run the risk of uh, blindly and naively simply reproducing the harmful and oppressive impacts of this operating system for future generations. Friends don't let friends reproduce oppressive operating systems. Okay, so if your body starts to reproduce an oppressive operating system, what do you do? Right? You, you pull them aside and say, hey, maybe we should talk about this. Friends don't let friends reproduce oppressive operating systems. Okay, so as those come in, uh, what else do we do at the beginning? We have a sign up sheet back there. If you're if your friend is coming and you know he's coming and you write down his name, then he doesn't come, we're gonna know. We know, we know what you guys look like. Um, that's our operating system. Um, okay. We are going to turn our attention to an unfinished topic from last week. We were so rudely interrupted by a uh, fire alarm. Um, so let's... Are we ready for that? Yeah, yeah I think we're ready for so that. I, 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 I will start. I will start today with a memory. So this week, Vilma Badia. Vilma Badia, which which is a great architect from Venezuela, passed away, and I want to dedicate my lecture to ah, Vilma. Is that touching. So Vilma, she was amazing. She was a great architect but also a good activist of public space and participatory urban design. And, and she coined a beautiful uh, word that I love. You know the word expansion, or expansion in Barcelona that we started two weeks ago. This idea that you can expand the grid. Vilma Maria coined the phrase insanction, yes. which is the, the expansion of within the city how the city can be expanded inside the city, and, and we, how we can use densification. And we're going to start it here through, for example, inclusionary zoning needs densification to, to, to make that happen. So I want to dedicate my lecture, our class to Bilma. She was an amazing architect, and she deserves our, our happiness and our thinking about, about the city. Okay, let's come back to the ladder. Let's start with the ladder of participation several slides away. So I don't know if you remember that we were discussing that we have levels of participation. The lower levels are the levels that we call the non-participation. This moment when you go to a community and you show your project and nice renders and you say, buy that, you can do that thing. 
and they, they say yes, okay, they will have to do it. And and then you can you can use a kind of manipulation of of the participant group process to ask community to do what we want to do. So what Cherry Armstrong in that they really say that this kind of manipulation is not really participation. And she also has a second level, which is therapy. You will be in this position in the future. I have a lot of some experience working with community. And many times you go to a community and they start talking and talking and claiming and claiming about the problems that they have. And you want to deal with a project. They are basically claiming and complaining and complaining and complaining a lot. And it's a more therapeutic, a therapeutic session rather than a real discussion about the problem. So, so you as an architect, if you are in a position working with the community in a participatory design or participatory planning project, you have to find ways to organize your meetings to focus in the time, to focus in FOCQS, focus in the, in the topic that, that, that you want to be discussed. Because sometimes you can have a more therapy rather, rather than a real discussion. This is what we call therapy. And then there is a second level that is called paganism. Do you know what paganism means? Okay, let me explain. Do you know token, 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 that word. Do you know what that means? So you imagine that you are in a casino and you have this little token. You, you can see that. I don't know if you have, you have, you have, you have, you have the age to go to a casino, but you can see that in so that in many movies. So these little coins. Or, or tokens that we pretend is money, but it's not. We are pretending that it's money, but it's not. So this is a token, something that we pretend it is, but it's not. So do you have that experience in your life? Right? I can give you some example. If you have an institution, for example, that have a DEI uh, team designing, you know, the diversity equity institution, and they have that person who have that person in the photo, but they really don't care about inclusion. That person is a token. They follow me. This is happening a lot. I have lots of experience about talking to my experience. So, for example, I work in an institution. I'm sorry. I work in an institution for, for an, an, uh, in this country. And they were happy to have me as a Latino immigrant in the board because, uh, because they can say that they were being inclusive. But when I start having position of power, they were more reluctant. So it was good when I was there without position of power. So I feel I understood that it was more a token than a real person. And if you have an institution that have you know black communities in the freshman years and the institution doesn't support them to succeed down to senior year, you can start believing that they are token. We are having them to I guess we want diversity, but it's not really embracing, embracing diversity. So we have to avoid that. It's better than non participation, got it. It's better than manipulate people, but you can, but it's not completely participation. This is a tokenism. So in participatory design process, imagine that you are uh, going to a community meeting and you inform there what you are doing. We're going to do this. We're not, we're not manipulating them. You are being really up and say, we're doing, we're going to do this. And you have to know. So she said that this is this this pretend is like a token. If that pretends to be participation, but it's not. Are you following me? And finally, I'm gonna I, I don't want to step in every single step of the lap of the ladder because you have to read and we have to be over today. And but she also goes that you can have partnership with communities. And you can also have delegate, delegate power to the community, and you can you can provide them citizen. So I want your opinion. What do you think is better in all of these levels? What is better for which level is better for design for? Yeah. And empowerment. Uh, okay, that's a good that, that's a that's a good. But what if you go to a community? And you, with your expertise, you realize that they will be flooded in five years. They don't know because they are not experts. Do you want to ask them to, to delegate the power? Say, what do you want to do? They say, we want a new playground in this area that will be flooded. You know that. 
In that case, you can inform them then to refer to plumbing or you prefer them to do what they want. Obviously, you will have to inform. It's your responsibility to inform with that game. My point here, and listen to me, this is my 20%. My, my 20% means that the American say very important. This is the okay. Yeah. Exactly. This is my 20%. This is a political ladder, and it's your decision, your ethical decision, which level you will use depending on your tribe. Sometimes you can delegate the power, and you can open the voice of the community completely. I have some experience where we gave the money to the people. Do whatever you want, because the conditions were set out to make that happen. But if you see some conditions where technically your voice has to be there, for some reason, it's your ethical responsibility to say that way. Even if you want to do that thing, we have to do this other thing because there are some risks for that. My point is that participation is not listening to voices from the community. Participation is creating a space of dialogue with the community where your voice is also that you're also participant of community design process or, or participatory design process. And this is something that is completely different about what is happening today in many participatory design processes, where you could see architects going to communities and saying, okay, let's do whatever you want that leads to you. I'm suggesting to you, according to the readings, that this is not enough. You have to be participant. You are also an important actor of these meetings. And you have to you have to listen then, but you have to make them listen to your voice as well. So it's a it's a dialogue, it's a, it's a dialogue process. So, so, just to wrap up the issue of, of participation, I want to start today connecting this with the issue of democracy uh, and how democracy works in capitalist, capitalist systems. I had this opportunity to listen some of these readings, and I'm going to summarize two that I think are really important to understand participation. One is one book called Participation, the New Theory. So the Cook and Kotani in 2001, they say, and it was basically very important in the in, 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 sorry, in participatory planning that you can have fear in it through participation. I'm gonna give you an example of fear in participation. In my country, I from, I'm from Venezuela, my country is the happens dictatorship. So because the dictatorship is so bad, you, you uh, so if people receive like you can take $10 per month, I don't kidding. Some people receive just a dollar per month, and you need around two hundred dollars to eat, just to have food. So you cannot have food with your salary. What the government do is that they prepare certain boxes called clap. Uh, that's the name, and these boxes contain food. So the only way that you have to eat is to have the the food that the government is providing for you. So they organize this participatory design process. You go to the meeting. And they have the boxes of food, and you say, if you participate, you will have food. If you don't, you won't. So that is participation and theory. You can have kind of manipulated participatory process that are not really participation, that are, that are framed as participatory planning, uh, and use that uh, as theory. And that happens very frequently with architects. Again, they go with nice renders and they pretend that they are asking the voice of the community. But in the other side of the street, we have Hiki and Mohan talking about participation from tyranny to transformation. It's how you can reimagine participation uh, as a tool to transform community if you really empower them and if you create these spaces of dialogue within the community. So I had the chance to to do, uh, to interview 424 people in this part of the world to discuss what is participation. And what I did is this survey. Do you don't remember the survey that we did last week? So this is basically the input from these 424 people. Sorry, getting back. This is the input for these 424 people. So this is the words that define participation from 424 people who were who completed the survey in this, sorry, in this in this segment of the world. And 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 this and and basically what I will do right now, uh, really fast, so passenger seat belts, 
is use the readings comparing to this word, trying to define participation through this participatory process. So participation includes future users. This is very important. So if you do participatory planning, what they say that you have to include not only the use, the current users, but the people who will use these spaces in the future. So you have to make a stakeholder map that understand who will be the real users of this. How do you expand these users? And you have you have the participation is meaningful if you have integrations in, in include them. This you also includes ways for people to, to to produce a certain change of space. So it could be a, a, a tool for control, but it's it, uh, and and they have certain weakness because you have people who manage participation like the architects and can weaken their participation if, if they manipulate the process. Um, but also it's a tool for consensus. No, I cannot. Not sure. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, it's an issue of, of cons it could be a tool of concession and for empowerment. It's basically a tool to provide to provide power. And this is the reason because later I will talk about participatory democracy as a counterweight of rep of representative democracy. And it's a political process. It's your decision is if participation is important or not. As, as architects of the process. And, and it, it includes certain power relations. So you are you, you have the power to manage the project, you have the power of the people who have the money, and the people have the power to not decide. And these relations of power creates the participatory process. And it could be a tool to uh, revitalize democracy. So I'm gonna so so and the other thing that I want to highlight here is that participatory process could be really, really fun. Really, really fun. So I, I gotta give you, give you some ex, some some examples about about participatory process. I was really lucky to be at the advisor of of Inter Inter American Develop Development Bank to design their participatory design um, method. Is that is a handbook that they use to manage participatory meetings in in Latin America, and this is part of this uh, document. And and they and we provided. 13 forms of participation that I am summarizing here for you in the, in the slideshows. You can read any of them if you want later, and you can ask me later if you, uh, if, if you want. But there are 13 forms of participation. So one is typical one is the traditional meaning that you have with, with community. But there are other forms. For example, you can have tactical urbanism. So tactical urbanism was invented by this amazing lady, Sadi Khan, uh, in New York City. So, uh, uh, so this was so this was basically uh, Times Square uh, in the in the night at, at the beginning of the century again. Yeah. And she, she and, and she said she started and said something. I mean, say why not we have more pedestrians in this? And everybody say no, that is impossible. That is Times Square. It's a it's a connection with this this avenue and this this, this this avenue Broadway. A lot of cars here. You cannot remove cars. It's important. And you know what you say? I said, this is that through participation. And she did art tactical urbanism, which is basically one day she painted the floor, just painting. And she put some umbrellas, like furniture, and she called some people to the community, some artists and food trucks and so on. And she did a weak test to see if that failed or not. The conclusion it was very weak. And it was increase of, of retail sales from the from the retail around Times Square. No, but nothing collapsed yet. Uh, did she get permission to paint the street? She basically was the uh, the 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 boss of DOP, the, the Department of <laughs> So she was she was the first who gave permission to paint. So basically, this is this is a uh, oh, but but that's a good question. Sorry, what is your name? Oh, and this is a great question. This start with one type of organism called guerrilla. So it's so it's it's, it's guerrilla organism. And 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 and, and basically it's what people doing that by their hand against the government. It's a process. Say that I want a part here, we do that uh, uh, without permission. But she decided to do that. The big the big revolution here, she made she made agreement with the community. And she made that from the government with painting, but then and she was called tactical urbanism. To tactic interventions with very, very cheap materials to test what happened. Surprise, 
nothing collapsed. New York was, the traffic was already jammed. It was already bad. And people who were able to enjoy Times Square, and you are not, I don't know if you're going to went recently to Times Square. It's already formal. You have formal materials there. You have a nice staircase that happens that appears in amazing Spider-Man 2, you know, that staircase with each fight against Electro. That staircase were built after this process. And 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 he did, he did everything very formal. So tactical, he used participation as a tool to do tactical organization. And she transformed that into a structural organization with real materials. So you can test the real very cheap. Uh, um, tactical organization is a process. So you have you you and, and that includes top down and bottom up and advocacy and development. And you can read this diagram with you with, with more level of details later to understand how tactical liberalism could be a tool for transformers public spaces. But there are other tools. The most traditional one are the citizen assemblies. You meet with the community and you explain what you want, you discuss, and you approve. And but you also have other tools. So this is a case where I have where I, where I was able to lead in Caracas where we ask people in post-its, like this one, to write the weakest the, and part of the city, the places that have more opportunities. You will basically with the SWOT map, a SWOT analysis with these colors. And then we projected the map of the city in a, in a blackboard, and we asked the community to post in where these things happen. So you see, we have an opportunity of great public space. Where do this happen? So we, and we, so we did a participatory mapping uh, with a GIS guy and the community, and that was to help us to create this map. And it's a map that changed week by week depending on this participatory process. So if you just look at these maps, these maps basically were in a website and they were changing depending on people, what people were saying in this, in this particular workshop. So this is a kind of how participatory planning happened with the interaction with the techniques, in this case, GIS, geographic information systems, and the participation of the community. Or we also do community technical tours. In this case, we went to a school and we asked the kids how they can perform this particular space. And we use a tool called Handy Shop. Like not workshop, Handy Shop. It's very basic. You put a piece of acrylic in front of the space. You see that in the right left corner, in the, in the top right corner. And we asked Rodrigo, who is a great uh, drawer, to draw in front of the space whatever they believe could be better for that space. So we're looking at the space. Off. And this is the result. So that's, if you put the acrylic, they were imagining uh, a public space here, a hospital. And we were basically collecting information from the kids and including that in the report and give that to the, to the, to the, to the city. So, you, so my point is that it would be very fun. So it's, uh, and um, or we we work also with this game board and and we redesign certain areas of petare with different levels of acrylics acrylics and can i advertise, advertise myself in this case Please. so we won an international competition as a best practice for you know yeah, you, 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 uh, you inhabit that for this project and I was very, I was really happy with that. And thank you for that. We were hired to do the same thing in Queens, New York. So this is the game board. The game board has certain rules. And you play this with these rules with communities to redesign certain fragments. So this is us playing the game to redesign this area with the community in Queens. And through that design, we develop certain layouts for the place. We and select one particular place, assign different activities, and read this uh, proposal and then you design projects. And this design project is, is a hybrid. It's not our proposal, it's not community proposal, it's a combination of the proposals. And uh, so but at the end, my problem is that you can have different tools that goes from public exhibitions to community meetings to citizen empower completely. So these have different levels of the ladder. In that case, in the, in the left, in the right, we spend one year training communities to run to manage budget, issues of transparency, uh, the management of, of, of materiality, how you and technical things about how to build uh, uh, a retaining wall. And after that happened in the year, we received part of the money of the budget of the city. We gave that completely to the communities. And they built their own 
So they decided where they had to deal, and they reported with, with, with the money that they used to the city formally, and they were uh, about it. About it. So they have an out of the shadow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And they audit their process. So you can, but obviously it, it took some gear to train people to make that. So yeah, so my, my, my conclusion there is that there is a room of creativity here to explore meta, to integrate, to empower community and to, and to increase democracy into your design process. If you integrate participation into, into, into design process, which is, I don't know if you remember what we, we, we were discussing last class. It's the, it's the opposite of this idea that Robert was saying that these guys who were designing the things top down diagrammatically from layouts, looking always in plan. So here you integrate not only the final product, but the process into your, into your, into your design process. So here, so I was telling you that they have 424 interviews states for these institutions. Last year we had, I don't remember how many people were here last year, but we have another team here. And this is basically, I compare the world Word map with our word map. Uh, so, and something that I also always realize when I do this type of analysis is that it's completely different. The, the responses from different stakeholders. So, if, if you talk with a community, they always ask for more democracy or more inclusion. If you ask for, for, for for uh, mayors or, or, or local governments, they always ask for more efficiency, more use of the uh, right use of the money. And we, if you ask uh, um, a designer, they will ask for more engagement, more design, more involvement of the design process. So the question is how we can put all of these issues together. So there is another big difference here that we don't have a number here like tomorrow. Um, so uh, just to conclude, is we were discussing last year, last year, last week, that participation is a tool for innovation. Remember why? Because you can, I, I think it was, I don't know who said that. I think Colton said that. So it's that it, it, you can innovate more through participation because you can open the voice to more visions. You can increase the possible solutions for one single thing. It could be more efficient because you can allocate precisely your resources, including your money, to the need, real needs of the community that you are serving. And it could be more, um, and a space for increased democracy. And this is the thing that we will discuss today, at how you can increase democracy. Thank you very much, guys. So moving forward to the uh, Guys? Let's look at that Mentimeter. So we have five responses, and uh, I think we want more than five. I don't know. Maybe that's, that's, what is that, 10% yeah. of the class? Um, you can also vote for these. I'm going to remove that. Well, we want them to. So you, you, you can remove that. You can access. In the top, there is a, the website called menti.com, and you have a code. So if you remove the core code, they will actually. Okay. Um, Stating design.
Well, still being, is there more to that one? I think, oh, let me scroll up. Okay. In pages of so keep. Keep it coming. If you've got more questions, please uh, get them in there. Um, so the question before us is, in the, what's the evidence like if we're trying to figure out how to push back against the oppressive, uh, the oppressive system, systematic, the, the operating system features that um, have proven to be oppressive uh, and against their goals, um, if they're being driven by capitalism, and capitalism is our operating system, is capitalism our operating system? Yeah. Do you want to change that operating system and do something other than capitalist? Or... Good luck. In the meantime, uh, capitalism is our operating system. Fortunately, when you hear people use, using the word capitalism, what they're talking about is not small c capitalism as in the natural operation of markets. They're not talking about supply and demand balancing each other in a, in a reflexive manner. They're not talking about what Adam Smith is talking about. They're talking about our current operating system dominant in the United States and thus the world, which should probably be called something else other than just capitalism. At the very least, it should be called capital C, capitalism, trademark. It's a very specific package the principles that allow monopoly capitalism. How many of you have a cell phone? How many of you pay more than you think you should pay for that monthly subscription? As in your family probably pays for you. How many of you have had a cell phone not in the United States? Does anyone have a cell phone outside of the United States? How much does it cost? How much? Not much. What is that? $20? You don't know the conversion. So why are cell phones, like, to, be, to the, uh, does the general population of sub-Saharan Africa have cell phones? It's a lot of poverty. Do they have smartphones? It's a lot of poverty in sub-Saharan Yes, they do. They have smartphones. Why? It costs so little in these other countries. Why are cell phones so much more expensive in the United States than any other place in the world? Monopoly capitalism. Probably, but but it's more crazy than many. Medicines. Why are medicines so much more expensive in the United States? Like 20 times more. Than in any other country. Why do people fly to Canada or Mexico? stay in a luxury hotel so that they can purchase their prescriptions for the year to come back to the United States because it's so much cheaper to get their prescription medications overseas than in the United States that it pays for the flight, it pays for the hotel, it pays for everything. Why is that? You can guess. It's the same answer. It's not capitalism, small c. It's monopoly capitalism, which is the dominant operating system of the United States. It's not capitalism, it's monopoly capitalism. There's a huge difference. 
And part of monopoly capitalism is not just controlling markets, it's also controlling, through lobbying, controlling government decisions. And we saw that in the automobile lecture, and we're just going back in history to try to figure out what's going on now. Why is participatory design practice so important now in the current context? And it's because democracy uh, has lost so many of its mechanisms for countering, they're called countervailing forces. We've lost labor unions. We've lost uh, one person, one vote. We've lost so many things. We don't have uh, one person, one vote. We don't have uh, labor unions. We don't have the voice of the people electing uh, people in office. We have dark money in politics. So we continue to lose these mechanisms for creating greater democracy. And so we need to figure out new ways. The only reason we're talking about participatory design and uh, democratic uh, processes is because we're so desperately in need of whatever we can get to expand the voice of people in the context of the dominant operating system of our, our system here, what we're doing uh, of, of monopoly capitalism. So in, in Tuesday's class, when we talk about, well, we could reduce the number of lanes from three car lanes to one car lane, and uh, your natural instinct, which is not uh, irrational, but we can't do that. That will, uh, that will take power away from you. The drivers will let that happen. The automobile companies will let that So there's all kinds of reasons we can't do that. We're being realistic. Uh, but how did we get here? And uh, so looking back at this history, which by the way, one of the reasons why um, I can take this uh, four hours of lecture content that I used to deliver in two hours and now deliver it in 30 minutes is because uh, you've seen it before. You saw it in history theory too. So we're going to quickly go through things. My, uh, as is often the case, I refer to this <laughs> diagram of the context for our architectural design is the dominant operating system. <clears throat> Today in this lecture, we're labeling that dominant operating system, monopoly capitalism, and its democratic uh, institutional arrangements of monopoly capitalism, which is a shrinking of political power. And that has a lot to do with the larger culture, principles and values of the United States and elsewhere. And uh, as you move beyond Studio Six, and into studios seven, eight, and in the graduate program especially, when students get into the thesis program, they start with culture, or they start with the operating system, and they say, what needs to change? What needs to shift to deal with uh, the challenges of the 21st century? They're thinking about that moment of truth in the year 2050, when everyone in the room turns their head to, to, to you, looking for the answer, you went to Wentworth, you're the one who's supposed to have the answers, and they want to be ready to have that answer when the moment of truth comes. Uh, they want to be able to outline a challenge that develops into a project that actually op opens up new possibilities in the operating system. Participatory design and democracy, expanding the mechanisms of democracy are part of that. The alternative is to be a good professional. My boss tells me I need to make a, a, a better solitary confinement cell uh, or a better, it's like being asked to design a slightly more humane slave ship. So you might find yourself designing a slightly more humane slave ship when what you really should be doing is looking for opportunities to dismantle and disrupt the operating system of slavery more general. So that's the model. And this is what it looks like in, in uh, the 20th century. This is Albert Eichmann on trial for uh, genocide uh, in World War II when 6 million Jews were systematically uh, murdered. 
uh, by the Nazis. And his defense is very directly related to uh, the ethical obligations of design professionals. That his argument was, I'm a good father. I'm a member of my church. I volunteer in the community. I'm a good person and I do my job. When I'm asked to do something, I do my job. I am a good German. I was being a good German. And Hannah Arendt, who's this brilliant thinker and writer of the 20th century, labeled this the banality of evil. Evil doesn't look, uh, in the real world, evil doesn't look like the Bond villain with the cat and, the, and you know, behaving badly. Well, sometimes it does. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't. But the more dangerous form that evil takes is I'm just doing my job. I'm keeping my head down. Listen, I've got student loans. I've got a mortgage. I don't want to lose my job. I'm just being a good artist, good employee. And that's what uh, true evil looks like. That's how it, it, it perpetrates uh, the atrocities that we see throughout history. And it's useful to look at history through that lens. And we did that. We looked at, through that lens. Um, one of the mechanisms we talked about, we're going to be talking about uh, democratic um, methods. We talked about participatory design. Another thing is design thinking. Business schools have always been focused on how do you make efficient and durable and dependable decisions. And so in the 20th century, business schools were all about uh, problem solving in a very specific way. Well, congratulations, design thinkers. Design thinking has been elevated to the favorite method of business school decision-making. Uh, and so much so that the Stanford Business School has rebranded itself from the B school to the D school. And step number one of design thinking is empathy. Step number one is to project yourself into the situation faced by the other users of the built environment, in our case. And deep empathy, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of class, comes in two forms. The first form, and they seem to contradict each other, you project yourselves, we are ethically obligated to project ourselves into the situation of our users. And the second one, which seems to contradict the first, is we also simultaneously acknowledge that we can never truly understand what it's like to be one of our users. So whenever we can, early, often, and uh, with great frequency, you ask. What's it like? How's it going? Is this right? How do you see the situation? So this is uh, a new thing since the uh, beginning of the 21st century. This is not how design was thought of, taught, and operated in the 20th century. And it's at the core, circling back to the right to the city, and uh, one of the questions that uh, we are facing in this class is what does it look like? How does design change when it's more democratic? What does part participatory design, uh, how does it manifest? What does it look like? What does it do? Because that's at the core of the analysis assignment. Every sentence doesn't just say, isn't this a cool design? Uh, every sentence of your analysis is saying this design move produces this experiential benefit or disadvantage, hopefully. So uh, circling back, this idea about capitalism, the capitalism that we're talking about now in the news and uh, as our operating system is not small C capitalism. Small C capitalism, which is a general uh, set of principles about the uh, the four ingredients you remember from high school when you took your economics course. Uh, the first two of these are very much the topic of this profession of, of architecture. Land, property, property values, 
and labor, which translates to us as housing. So the land and the labor equation is all about the architecture. Now, Naomi Klein is a very important contemporary critical voice. And uh, I have a great deal of respect for her, but she has gotten it profoundly wrong by thinking, by falling into this trap of characterizing the system that is destroying the planet as capitalism. Capitalism in its classical sense would have a long time ago identified things that could be quantified by markets and the balance would have shifted if capitalism, if small C capitalism had been operating as it should, as it had always, as markets were working the way they should be, then it would have become very expensive to pollute. It would have been very expensive to extract things out of the planet and very expensive to put carbon into the air. But the operations of monopoly capitalism have stopped, have blocked those mechanisms that would have put prices on all of these things. And as a result, how much does it cost to extract things from the earth, even though they're getting more and more rare? It's just the cost of the low uh, paid laborers uh, who are digging the hole. That's basically the cost. And to ship it, ship that lithium uh, out of Africa and into uh, the factories of China where they're making the batteries, et cetera. It's almost free. It's ridiculously low. How much does it cost to dump carbon into the atmosphere that's destroying uh, societies all around the world? How much does it cost to put carbon into the atmosphere? What's the price of a ton of carbon? It's free. Why is that? It's because capital C monopoly capitalism has done an excellent job of blocking any operations that would put a price on carbon, at least in the United States, because other countries do put a price on carbon dumping. But that makes it hard to compete with the United States. So uh, the rules of the operating system as they exist to this moment are, are still whoever extracts the most the fastest and whoever dumps the most fastest wins. If, if you have a hundred really good people and you say, here are the rules of the game, whoever extracts the most and dumps the most wins, gets the most money, go. It doesn't matter if 99 of those very good people say, no, 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 that's not the right ethical thing to do. That one person is going to dominate the market and do as much extracting and as much dumping as the 100 would have shared in. So it doesn't matter. So you might as well all, if, you, if you're part of that 100, if that's the rules of the game, and remember we started this semester with game theory, this is how operating systems work. And that's why the game the gamification of participatory planning is so brilliant in what uh, Ignacio has been doing for the last few years. In the context, if you look at it as game theory, this is the way to think of it. This is her movie. We have to be the global north with less than 20% of the population responsible for over 70% of global emissions. Most of them in my environment's interests have the least responsibility for creating this crisis in the first place. The man in fossil fuel that was combusting here would be this growing. We're going in completely the wrong direction. 
I spent six years wandering through the wreckage caused by the carbon in the air and the economic system that put it there. That almost fell out of real force with the tragedy either by the environment or by us. Okay. Small into the front line of that. You see the incredible transformation. They become stronger, they start to go. So here's the big question. What is global warming? These are only a crisis. What if it's the best chance we're ever going to get to build another world? Change? Or there are limits. Let's celebrate the limits because we can reinvent a different future. So, what she's missing here is that we don't have to erase capitalism. It's not a fun project to shout out against capitalism. Instead, I think what we need to do, what I'm encouraging you to do, what is part of the architectural ethics of practice in the 21st century, is to alter the operating system of capitalism without abandoning capitalism, but using small c capitalism to push back against the monopoly capitalism that is dominating our system. And since we are part of this equation, the good news and bad news. The bad news part is that architects are part of the problem. But that is also the good news. Because if we're part of the problem, we're not external to the system. We don't have to tear the system down. We can operate in an ethically responsible way to alter the system to do a better job than it is doing. Can I can help connect with some dots here? Yeah. So I don't have to remember that a few weeks ago when we were talking about climate justice. Our first lecture. Yeah. So we, I, I showed you the book about the living room. That book of Club of Club of Rome, nine two go So we realized we after we see it, we saw the blue marble, the, the the air from the from the Apollo thirteen room, you know that the view from the from the from the earth to the from the from the space to the earth. We realize that we that the, that, the, that we have a limit of growth. So, extractive capitalism or monopoly capitalism believe that they can extract forever without limit. So, I really like the video that you showed over because the, and, and the final part, this lady from India, she said, "If we have limits, let's embrace the limits. Mm -hmm. Probably limits are basically the big thing that we can have to imagine and be." Capitalism with C was was lower C capital. Right. It was lower C is how we can understand that our limits is a tool to reinvent capitalism in a way that is more sustainable. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna very quickly move through the next hundred slides. You've seen it. Where did this extractive capitalism come from? Let's go back to uh, the world uh, before Columbus struck out across the, the ocean. We have these empires, uh, including the Incan, the Mayan, and the Aztecs. Over here, we have Africa, which is a source of great wealth, and the Ming Dynasty China is sending its explorers across the Indian Ocean. Uh, what year are we at here now, 1558? And then very quickly, this little kingdom of Portugal they send out, Henry the Navigator sends his ships around and starts to uh, make landfall. And this becomes the Gold Coast and the Slave Coast uh, as the Portuguese start to extract. They're basically, this colonial effort, in the name of the church, the Catholic Church, to win souls, they are also, as a consequence, as a collateral of winning souls for the church, they're also extracting slaves, gold, treasure, wealth, and they shoot across the Indian Ocean, uh, Vasco da Gama saying, for souls and spices 
They're heading here where the spices come from, worth more than their weight in gold back in, in Europe. They're looking for the spices in the Spice Islands over here. Uh, and they dominate. Uh, the, the church sets up a headquarters in Goa, another one in Tajima Island uh, of Japan. And the Portuguese and the Spaniards are competing with each other, the two Catholic uh, kingdoms, monarchies. And so the Pope says, listen, guys, we're all Catholics here. Why don't we draw a line right here? That's why we speak Portuguese in Brazil, Spanish in the rest of Latin America. That's why we speak Portuguese in East Timor, in Macau, and Spanish in, in the Philippines. What's the main thing? So this is just the big outline. The Portuguese are the first across the Indian Ocean. They have a sense of the world. And then the Spaniards, the Spaniards are taking their part of the world. And then when the Pope is told, listen, Pope, that's not good enough, the world, it turns out, hey, who knew who were this from? Okay, so let's extend that line around the globe. And you have, this is the treaty between the two Catholic powers. And so these two kingdoms are sending ships uh, out of their harbors in Lisbon and Seville, and they come back with gold and silver and slaves, and it causes inflation and across the globe because of all the silver. Columbus uh, does his thing, and the Spaniards encounter the Aztec city of the Mexica, uh, now called Mexico City, and it was the largest city in the world. The Europeans had never seen anything like it. It was a gridded city. And we're going to talk about the operation of grids next week. But the grid becomes a mechanism for transformation and conquering. Uh, and they use the architecture at every step. They tear down the stones of the Aztec temples and monuments, and they use those stones to erect uh, chapels, cathedrals, uh, palaces, and the law of the Indies is used as a, as a mechanism. It's a, form, it's a set of rules about the formal, spatial, institutional arrangements of Spanish colonial cities. And every city in the Spanish empire follows some version, some interpretation of these formal, spatial, institutional rules about setting up gridded cities. It's not just an efficient, formal, spatial arrangement. It's also part of having the church control the labor. Uh, since Queen Isabella said, thou shalt not enslave Christians. Once you convert the indigenous populations of the Americas, you are not allowed to enslave them. So they did what monopoly capitalism continues to do. They have all of the mechanisms, all the benefits of slavery without formal slavery. Now we call it prison, but uh, we still are doing this. So if you're interested in what's happening in prisons uh, in the United States, it goes back to, it, it's, a, it's an echo, it's a reverberation of the encomienda system of Spanish colonial. Encomienda, encomienda is a status of servitude that uh, is not technically not slavery. You have a labor force that gets uh, fed by the fruits of their labors, but it's totally controlled. Yeah, and, and one of the things that they, they, they weren't paid with real tokens, but with tokens. Tokens, there we go. Yeah. Um, and this mountain in, uh, of Potosi, the mountain of silver, and through the encomienda system, they flooded Europe with, with silver that they just filled their ships with out of Cartagena and sent back to Sevilla. Um, and there's the city of Potosi today. And it was racial, this takes us back to um, race-based slavery, which was the first lecture of history theory too. And these paintings are basically catalogs of status where the painter for a, a, a bride <clears throat> would paint your portrait with more white pigment and paint your rivals with darker pigment because skin tone was the, the currency of the day in terms of whether or not you could rise in society. This was a catalog of status based on skin tones. 
The next chapter has to do with switching from uh, colonial uh, extraction of monarchs to the corporation. The international corporation was invented in London in 1601. And the next year, the Dutch followed suit. They were both called the East India Companies. And uh, we look at the English and the Dutch and their uh, episodes, they are uh, the, the Dutch golden age that we would normally study in architectural history is not really understandable unless you also understand the history of Batavia, its Javanese colonial place. It's basically two sides of town, the rich side in the Netherlands and the poor side in Java and separated by 10,000 kilometers of sailing. But basically the wealth is extracted from the south side and taken to the north side. And that's what results in the explosion of uh, Amsterdam. And the architectural mechanisms are the market building built on the dam and the bank and the church. And these, the, this is an architecture that produces trust. And it was the original open market where you have lots of buyers, lots of sellers. And this is the basic principle of small C capitalism. When you have lots of buyers and lots of sellers in the same place, uh, the buyers are bidding and the suppliers are offering at lower and lower price because of competition. That's literally the original open market of small C capitalism. And uh, it was a mechanism, this architecture was a mechanism for establishing market prices. The prices established in this market on the dam at Amsterdam were printed up and sent all over Europe because it was the most active market because of the success of this architectural arrangement. It had everything to do with trust. The, the mackerel or the herring I'm showing you in, in this bowl, uh, are not, I'm not, I'm not going to sell you these. They're over here on my boat. Let's go check. You can check on the quality and freshness of my herring. Oh, no need, because I trust you, because this is a, a system of checks and balances. The, the, the uh, government controller of weights and measures, is their building is right here, so they can make sure that the scales are calibrated. So it's a mechanism of trust. <clears throat> it's not just a building, it's also uh, uh, it's an urban arrangement that the, the, the first market, the second market, the uh, headquarters for weights and measures, and the town hall, which includes the merchant's bank. So the thing that came out of this is paper, trust in paper. You can have shares. I can purchase just the herring here, take my certificate to Antwerp uh, and take delivery on those herring in Antwerp because of the trust that was constructed out of these systems. And so, uh, and this, on the other side of this system uh, in Batavia, uh, is another system, but this is one of punishment, I believe the gallows here, uh, of prisons, of fortifications, and here's the market in, on the Javanese side, here's the market in Amsterdam, the warehouse, the city hall being built, the cathedral, and the market is just out of the picture here. And we basically have a catalog of who are the people participating in this. You have the same catalog here. Sometimes these portraits these paintings were done by the exact same artist. Sometimes the canal town was uh, drawn by uh, the same architect. So you have the explosion of Amsterdam and the explosion of Batavia, both based on the same um, theoretical model um, uh, that was published and people followed. So the, the takeaway here is that these architectures and these cities are, are the infrastructure of the operation of this, the operating system. Uh, just like today, the roads, the bridges, the canals, the 
uh, the ship, the shipping containers, the, the ships, the cities, the ports, uh, the government institutions. This is a complex intertwining infrastructure of global trade that keeps the whole operating system going. Architecture is not separate. From that. Architecture is at the heart of that. And the biggest thing um, is housing and housing segregation and the ability to, uh, to oppress people, not for the sake of oppressing them, but for the sake of reducing the costs of labor. And so there's pushback uh, when the conditions in London get to be so severe um, that they instituted a series of housing reforms. And uh, this was the focus of the reading that you did on Frederick Engels looking at worker housing in the city of Manchester. Along these high streets, you have shops that look quite positive, but in, behind that facade, that thin, thin uh, costume of plenty and, uh, and opulence, you have the oppressive living quarters of the workers who have to be within walking distance of the factories. And I can go through this quickly because you've seen it before. I know you remember this from uh, the lecture uh, between January and February of 2023. You probably have it in your notes. Some factory owners said uh, they, made the, they made the connection. The quality of my goods, this is a, uh, a stove manufacturer, cast iron stove manufacturer. The quality of the goods we produce depends on the quality of the workforce. If they are feeling stressed, if they have bad health, if they're uneducated, uh, I'm not gonna have a high quality workforce and so I'm not gonna be able to compete in the market. Plus I'm a good person. So uh, factory owners in England and then in the United States, uh, took it upon themselves to try to increase the quality of life of their workers, in large part through housing, education, healthcare, and recreational uh, activities, always connected to religion as well. And so you have an um, increase in, in living conditions, and we see the same thing in New York City with these tenement housings, uh, they're you know, just very oppressive and led to uh, violence and rebellion that had to be put down. And that leads to reforms um, of standardized grid structures. Remember, next week we're gonna really go deep into grids as a strategy for reproduction, reproducing systems. This was an effective system. You could design one tenement building and it, you design it once and it works on every site in Manhattan because every site is 25 feet wide and 100 feet deep. And they did that and passed a series of housing reforms to increase the access to light and air, starting with this, with, with back uh, buildings that were really bad conditions. Some, this is the situation that uh, is roughly equivalent to what Engels was writing about reading. And then it slowly got better with the air shafts. Um, this is the one I lived in when I was in architecture school. Uh, and then even larger courtyards. Uh, and then to this point, and once these standards were established, any new construction in Manhattan had to follow the new thing. If you tear this down, you have to build this. And that's how uh, Manhattan was transformed uh, through the increasing quality of housing, also schools, healthcare, libraries, etc. And so this is takes us up to the present. This is the context for the situation we find ourselves in today, when housing affordability keeps uh, getting worse and worse and worse. And one of the reasons why it has gotten worse is because uh, our clients, when we talk to our clients about the next project, 
And we tried to say, you know, why don't you want to do a three family instead of a one family? What does the client say? I'm just barely holding on here. I got to make money. I got to put, I got to pay for tuition. My kids can go to Wentworth. It's not free. I've got to maximize my return on investment. I'm a good person, but I can't afford because of the operating system. I cannot afford to do the right thing and make a six family house. I have to do what makes the most money for me. And the way the operating system works, and you will find this out when you talk with your clients, uh, the way to make money is to build a three or $4 million house in the greater Boston area, single family house. So as a result, there's a desperate mismatch between housing demand and housing supply. The average household size in the United States is between one and two people per household. It used to be four people per household. That's why we had single family houses with three bedrooms or four bedrooms. Now it's 1.5 or six, but are we building diff housing differently? No, as a matter of fact, just like we're putting more carbon into the air now than we ever have in any previous year, we're building more single family houses now than we ever have before. And those single family houses are bigger. The average housing uh, square footage is double what it was five years ago. And this brings us back to what we talked about in terms of housing as an investment property, which is distorting. It's an, yet another layer of distortion on housing markets. So what do architects do to alter the outcomes within this context of this uh, powerful operating system that makes it so difficult to do the right thing. Here's an example. Do you know Sam Maddox? You know Sam? Oh. Sam was uh, the product of this program uh, in Al University of Alabama <clears throat> called the Rural Studio. This architecture professor said, listen, let's not just study uh, how to do rhino models in the abstract. Let's design houses for real people who need it most, and then let's go build them. There's another similar program at University of Utah that a friend of mine is involved in. Um, there's another one in Oregon. Uh, maybe we should do that here. Maybe we should connect with Habitat for Humanity and do some building. Who's, who would like to do some actual building? It's kind of what we do, right? It's kind of our brand of one word. So in this case, um, Sam Mockby uh, identified, basically asked the question, who needs the housing the most? And so he identified the most impoverished county in Alabama, Hale County. And he went there, talked to them, met them, and asked them, what do you need? And as a result, uh, they designed and built these houses for about 15 years. Uh, and then when Mockby died and the next uh, set of faculty inherited the rural studio, they said, you know, that was great. We built 50 or 60 houses. Students learned how to design and build for real clients and not wealthy clients, but the, the most impoverished clients uh, in our state, uh, and maybe the country. Um, but we have to do more. The scale of the problem demands that we do more than one house per semester. So they looked at the financing conditions and they designed houses that matched the mortgage rates uh, and the social security income of households in the state of Alabama and other places in the United States. And so they, what they realized is we need to be able to build a beautiful, dignified house for $20,000 or less. So that was the design challenge. How do you design houses that can be paid for by people's social security checks? And this is the result. And instead of uh, building, uh, designing and building 50 houses, they designed uh, several dozen houses and built hundreds of houses because they, as architects, they acknowledged that it's not just the formal spatial arrangements, it's the formal spatial institutional arrangements. They acknowledge that bank financing matters. 
the social security system matters, and to really serve the needs of our clients, we need to embrace that larger package of the formal spatial institutional arrangements. <clears throat> this is a portrait of uh, housing supply in the United States. If you ignore this, this is what we have. We have lots and lots of single family houses and lots and lots, and a few, in a few uh, cities, we have mid-rise apartments. A lot of that is public housing. What we don't have since 1920, since the depression, the 20s, we built lots of this, but after World War II, when we started building again, this is what we built. We built single family houses in the suburbs. The operating system is set up to build lots and lots of those. This is where the demand is, and this is what is not exactly illegal, but can you build a triple decker in the Boston area? It's not illegal, but there are parking requirements. The parking requirements make it almost impossible to do a triple decker. That's surprising to many of us because triple deckers are like to the biggest supply of housing in a lot of main cities. Wentworth has had a hand in helping Boston and other cities to make triple deckers uh, viable as an option. And so the missing middle is uh, a, a blanket concept of how do we as architects change the operating system so that we can start supplying housing that matches the demand. Yes, John. Exactly. And many towns and cities have taken their parking minimum requirements and either gotten rid of them or replaced them with parking maximums. So instead of saying, uh, if you have uh, three units, triple decker, uh, with uh, three bedrooms each, you need to have six parking spaces. Well, you know how big a triple decker is. I don't have space on the lot for six parking spaces. So it's not until towns and cities change the parking requirements. So you have a maximum of three parking spaces, one maximum of one parking space per unit, that all of a sudden the market is capable of responding to the demand where it really is, which we need this type of mixed middle housing. Yeah, but this is something that you said at uh, the beginning of this topic, but you said single family housing would like make more good quiet than trying to do multi family housing. Yes. It seems kind of backwards. The biggest single reason is when I'm proposing multi family housing, name a town, uh, the neighbors don't want me to build multi family housing. They want me to build nothing. But if they can't get me to build nothing, uh, then a single family house will do. The, when, you, when you move to a town, you, maybe you're already uh, aware of this because uh, of the politics in New England towns. Uh, towns and cities throughout the United States are terrified by three things. Babies, traffic congestion, and uh, parking demand. If I'm a town, if I'm the town of fill in the blank, you know, Lumenster, fill, name your town that you went to high school in the New England area. My biggest fear is having to educate another child. You know how much it costs to educate a child in the public school system? In the state of Massachusetts is something like $18,000 a year per school child. I can't afford that. I vote, I, I move that we make a law. No one can purchase a house in our town if they have children or are of childbearing age. Who's with me? Uh, it's illegal. No, one of you is supposed to say it's, that's housing discrimination. You're not allowed to do that. Okay, let's game the system to do the next best thing. You know that quarter acre lot zone we have? Let's make it one acre minimum lot size. That way, instead of four families with, with eight children, we only get one family. Who's with me? And that one acre zone, 
let's change it to five acre minimum zone for a house. That's what the towns and cities throughout the United States have been doing for decades. It's not illegal. Uh, it's adjacent. It's a legal adjacent. It also solves our traffic and uh, parking problem. What's the worst thing you can do to a town that's decided to reduce the number of units that can be built in their town by changing the minimum zone? This, multifamily housing. Lots of little babies screaming and just money coming out of my town budget and more traffic and more less parking. So I have, sorry, can you do that with, without changing the, these, the model of the city? So yes. So my goal is that if you want to change the type of house that we produce, can you do that without more public transportation or more public space or with more diversification of the location of, of, of schools? Um, so until recently, yes. So um, in the United States, we separate church and state, and we separate transportation from housing, and we separate uses in different parts of town. We separate everything. And in the 20th century, we asked our engineers, how should we plan our cities to uh, maximize traffic flows? And they gave us their answer uh, but without even considering what it does to neighborhoods and, and public health. And now in the 21st century, like Stanford Design School, the D School, the business school, we have turned away from single siloed, uh, specialized, narrow definition of problems. We've taken a design approach. Please, friends don't let friends consider housing without transportation. Friends don't let friends consider schools without housing, et cetera. We're taking a holistic design integrated approach, just like you're doing in Studio Six, where you have mechanical en envelope, uh, mechanical systems, program areas, it's all in the site design. You're integrating all these things. This is what architects are so good at, have always been good at. These are the skills for problem solving in the 21st century. Um, one of the strategies is instead of doing single use zoning, we use form-based codes. It's not so much the use as it is the form. And so we, we replace probably with another overlay district zone, we replace those requirements of you can have businesses here, but no housing. You can have housing here, but no business. Instead, you can do whatever you want, but the form of the building has to be more or less like this. That's one way we're doing it. The other thing, and this is a direct response to what Ignacio is saying, state of Massachusetts noticed that some towns have successfully zoned out any possibility of uh, anything but big houses on big lots and very, very few children. And they said, no, unless you have 10% of your, your housing market, your housing stock is uh, in the affordable category, then a developer can come into your town and do whatever they want. They can build anything they want and any lot they want until your housing supply gets, uh, gets over 10%. Uh, it's not a poor law, it's a law that's a developer that's Say that again. Uh, it's not a bad law. Really excited developer to build single family houses. Yes. Money. Is there a conflict? Yeah. So this is the government. The government of the state of Massachusetts has said, "Enough's enough. We have to stop this exclusionary zoning um, state. We have to have every town uh, pulling its weight. We need places for school teachers, college professors." Uh, the people who work uh, in, uh, in the food service, they need to be able to live closer to where they work. We need every town to have a minimum of 10% of its housing stock to be in the affordable category. And if it's not, then the developer can come in, and even though it's a five-acre minimum zoning for a single-family house, he can build whatever he wants. He can build 
a 60 unit building uh, at the edge of town if he wants to do that. Until your town gets 10%, you are uh, in trouble. And so town after town have said, whoa, 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 okay, we have to build that housing. And so uh, on Route 2, uh, near Concord, all of a sudden all that housing showed up. That's Concord saying, okay, we'll, we'll do the right thing. They're a wealthy town. Uh, they want to protect their residents. So they built a ton of housing uh, to, to satisfy this rule so that they were not vulnerable. So since 1997, when you see lots of whites, light greens and dark greens uh, until, and so now you have a lot more blue, which is in compliance. The blue, blue towns are the places where they've hit the 10% and gone down. So multi family housing does make the market single for the development. You think. Uh, but because so, there's so much NIMBYism not in my backyard, uh, and it, uh, I, I, can, I can purchase a property and turn it around within two years in Newton if I just keep it stick to that house. But in order to make it uh, multi-family housing, I've got to go through all of these hurdles. And it takes me five years. And time is money. I can't have uh, time for this. But if you're a developer, then the state is pushing for this stuff. It is. So wouldn't it be a little bit easier, I guess? Uh, the state is mandating it. Uh, and, and some people have decided they're going to do multi-family housing. They're a minority because it's a very hard path. Um, uh, it's just the market, uh, the market, uh, capital C, monopoly capitalism forces and the political, uh, these things are integrated. So towns and townspeople and town councils and public agencies are all fighting against uh, multifamily housing in their communities. That's why the state took such a dramatic step is to say, uh, we hereby suspend all zoning dimensional limitations until you hit 10% of the point. And, uh, but there's something that a lot of us have noticed. If you build this multifamily housing out of the edge of town, you're causing huge traffic and parking problems. And so uh, 40B is the base law, and we got up to 40R, and then we get to 40S, 40R and 40S has to do with, 40R has to do with schools and 40S has to do with transportation. So now, more recently, the rules are uh, you uh, identify the lots, the incentives that we restructure so that we put those multifamily houses near the center of town, near bus uh, stations, near train stations, near transit stops. So it's closer to transit-oriented development which you've heard before. <clears throat> and this is an example. Um, and then the final and most extreme example is what the city of Cambridge is doing now. At city of Cambridge, have they surpassed their 10%? Way beyond 10%. But the single biggest issue of people in Cambridge is we want affordable housing. We are being crushed with housing costs. Those of us who own, congratulations, woo, high five. We're doing great, thank you very much. But our children, how are they going to even rent? It's crazy what's happening in the Boston area. So we came up with a thing called the affordable housing overlay. There are certain parts of Cambridge where basically uh, we've, we've imposed on ourselves the same 40B rules that in certain parts of town, uh, you can build as much housing as you want. Almost no limit. You can go up to uh, 180, 100 feet along Mass Ave. And so this is an example at Leslie College. The owner of this asked me what to do with this building. I said, tear it down. It's horrible and build housing. They kept it and built housing. What if I don't want that apartment to replace it? What if I get what the, city of Cambridge, the city of Cambridge has said, yeah. as a matter of fact, there's a proposal for a six-story building next to my house 
way far away from any mass transportation. And my neighbors are fighting it to the nut. And I advise them to say, listen, you're just playing into their hands. You are being classic nimbus. You know what it's me being? You're being classic nimbus. Uh, you're trying to obstruct this housing development. And the whole re justification for the affordable housing overlay is that NIMBYism, lawsuits, and political efforts to block housing construction has caused a crisis. You're just uh, creating, preparing the soil for even more extreme legal action. Uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better if you want to behave this way. But their response is, but there's going to be so many people here. In my backyard, literally, they're saying this. Say, oh, um, you're just making it worse. It turns out, do we hate people? Well, some of us do. No judgment. But it's not so much the people as it is your children going to public school. It's very expensive. And once you get over that, we, we love people. They actually support our businesses and they work for us and they. They you know it's wonderful. People, the thing we hate about people is not the people themselves, it's their cars. They clog up my street and well, they make bad. it harder for me to find parking. Right? So the answer, acknowledging that's a legitimate concern, is you build these things on Mass Avenue where and you don't you don't you have a lot of parking. You control the driving by limiting the parking. When you have free parking, when you only charge what rent charges per day of parking, it's an invitation to, to drive and park. Uh, but the students who are paying tuition and not driving are subsidizing the presence of every car to the tune of about $80 a day. Uh, um, if you compare it to the value of that land that the part that the car is taking, uh, the parker is paying how much a day? Five dollars, six dollars. Andrew, how much you paying? Uh, so, do the math. How much is that per day? So, yeah, it's a good math. Like we, so we did this. Zero bucks per day. That's cheap. So, those of you who are not driving, your tuition is basically subsidizing that parking spot to the tune of about $80 a day. So parking is a big tool in addressing the thing we don't like about people. We love people, some of us. What we don't like is their cars and their competition for parking spaces. So that's it. It's my part of the lecture, but we have another part of the lecture. There's some of the discussion we can that. So yeah, what is this? So these are the neighborhoods where you can build um, up to 80 feet. And here's the one next to my house. <clears throat> All of these, you know, Harvard Square, Mass Ave, Kendall Square. Have you seen Kendall Square lately? Woo! Right? But and over here, Alewife, out by Route 2. But then there's this one next to my house. My neighbors hate the idea that you can build eight-story towers on that parcel uh, so far. In it. But they don't like the mass of the building. They don't like the competition, parking, and driving. I don't like that it's so far away from transportation, so far away from Mass Ave. Um, it's just too far for people who don't want to walk all the way to the courts to start to stop. So if we look at this whole thing and your questions, so many of these things, the question about the stadium, who wants the stadium in that city, uh, in that place? It's the business community. They want the stadium and they want the city to uh, subsidize. And so they lobby the hell out of that. They throw money at it. They elect and unelect people, and they get their stadium that they can. Does a stadium uh, stimulate the economy of the local community? Yes. 
Depends on the support. Did it Taylor Swift do like a ton the economy so like everywhere she was Taylor Swift is a force of nature. It's probably not a useful comparison. But what's the difference between American football and baseball? How many, how, many, how many home games do we play in American? 16 versus 160. Right. So which is better for the local economy? A baseball stadium or an American football stadium? Uh, baseball. And now Put, put uh, one of them in the center of the city. If, if instead of Fenway Park, it would all be mass transit. What if there was football? That would be devastating. It would kill, it would kill uh, the neighborhood. But baseball, pretty good. Plus, are there huge parking lots around Fenway Park? Don't you wish it was cheaper to park on game day? Well, yeah, but Fenway and Wrigley are the one things. Right, Fenway and Wrigley and Detroit. Uh, Detroit has their own urban, but but it's served by Mass Transit. It's an urban stadium. It's actually pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. and I I saw Paul McCartney there. He's no the big uh, Taylor one. Swift. The big one. No, the real one. Yeah. Did he? Never heard of it. No. So stadium. Stadium is one of the hot potatoes of monopoly capitalism and our current system. Lobbying is the key thing to everything. If you want to change the system, um, vote for someone and, and write to your senator and say, we need to, uh, to pull back on the campaign finance, change the changes to the campaign finance laws that are made 15 years ago. Um, which is... How, how do we balance uh, urban development with the importance of developing capitalism? Some people say, and this is all going back in the way to Singapore. Remember the Singapore story that we started at the semester with? When they were ejected from Malaysia, and the expectation was that there would be mass starvation and collapse of the society of Singapore. But what happened then? They said, hey, let's improve the housing, the transportation, the education, and let's have the best, highest educated, most skilled workforce with the highest quality of life for the lowest wages so that we can become a manufacturing powerhouse. And they did it. They did it by improving housing, improving education, improving transportation, and controlling congestion through congestion pricing, among other things. And so, this is a, a reference point. Is it the government versus the free market? No. There is no such thing as a free market until a government establishes the infrastructure that allows the market to operate. The ports, the roads, all of that stuff. Singapore simply made a rational decision in the face of a crisis to create the most highly qualified workforce at the lowest cost and it worked, and they won the game. They won the capitalist competition game by investing in housing, education, healthcare, uh, transportation. It works. So it's really not versus. If, cap if monopoly capitalism knew what was good for it, they would be the first ones saying, let's have stronger controls on the markets and make it work for everyone. Industry versus health, for better or worse, actually for better, industry now has cleaned up its act. We don't have uh, smokestacks squelching smoke in the air, uh, ruining the neighborhood. Most industry, as it returns to the United States, are relatively clean industries that do not harm the environment. And so you don't need the single use zoning that we used to have, keeping the smokestacks away from the housing. Um, so that, that's actually uh, the magic of market forces and technological advancement, which are very closely connected, has resulted in this not being such a difficult trade-off. There are exceptions. Petrochemical industries, Galveston Bay, is uh, kind of a, a time bomb that um, 
Gulf of Mexico will destroy this whole thing with great consequences. Uh, have we seen like housing pop up around the back? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we don't see housing coming up around factories. What we see, look at Queens in Brooklyn, you see factories coming up around housing. You see these loft communities and these industrial uh, neighborhoods that have become housing. When industry fled to uh, the global south, out of the United States where labor was cheaper for a few years, uh, all of a sudden all these industrial fabric became great for housing or for an architecture school, because uh, that's basically Amex is an industrial building that became a technical school. Became a school. And, and this is basically because factories are becoming less mechanical and more digital, and factories are changing, so they are more yeah. and more fragmented. So there is an opportunity there. Smaller. They are smaller. Yeah. So there are a big opportunity to do the opposite. Instead of moving the output of the factory, to move the factory. And it's, it's all possible because we put an overlay district uh, to uh, overcome the single use zoning. Single use zoning laws are extremely destructive. One of the slides I should have shown you is the one that showed uh, the elimination of single family zones uh, uh, in cities. Cities throughout the US are now saying all these single family home zones. We now uh, declare them void. They are all we allow accessory dwelling units (ADU) everywhere. You can build a second unit over your garage in your backyard. You can uh, rent it out. You can make it Airbnb, and it's effectively doubling the density of many towns potentially as accessory dwelling units become part of it. And other neighborhoods are saying factories, industrial uses, commercial uses. Welcome to our formerly residential neighborhood. Thank you for making our lives better. Yeah. So I, I there is I, I want to not five minutes. I, I want to say something, wrapping up some of the thing that you were saying, Robert, is that in urbanism, in, in our discipline, in architecture, there is always a discussion about the difference between policies and projects. So do we have these two tools? We have policies and projects. And this is always a chicken egg question, what we should be confirmed. So, because you can reduce the amount of cars through a policy. You say you reduce the amount of car units with houses, and, and you can build more houses if you have parking lots. Done. But people could say, yeah, but you need projects. How we can live inside the house that is in the city without a parking lot if, we, if I need to use the car to move? So, I need the project, transportation, public space, uh, uh, factories. And industries inside the city. Or what confers if you have this, uh, the, the, these projects inside the city, but you don't have the policies, probably that won't happen. So it probably should be both at the same time. Yeah. Policies and projects. We have policies like you, you were describing, and projects that we were describing last week about doing new type of facilities, new type of transportation systems, new type of complete streets inside the city. So probably more densification and the and the mix uh, the the mix of the uses happens with, with, through these two ways policies and projects come together and the perspective uh, of being able to understand the interplay between projects and policies are amongst the most valuable uh, set of skills and experiences in governments the most effective and powerful members of the city council in town after town are architects who understand the interplay between planning and zoning rules and the shape of the city and the outcomes for the well-being of the, of the community. I, 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 I can rephrase that. Architects were aware of, of the role of changing the systems. Yes. Because you can have architects that only, because that's a, that's a problem that we have in city planning right now. You have architects who design the project and they do not understand how they change the system. And you have politicians who design the policies but they do not understand how they change the space. Right. So you have the role to connect these two extremes of position. And this is happening not just in the urbanism concentration, but in every concentration at Wentworth, you're challenging the young designers of the next generation to understand the interplay, the complex, sometimes complex dynamics that occur between the project and the larger operating system. 
that friends don't let friends just do a project that leaves uh, dysfunctional operating systems to operate. Uh, that it runs the risk of reproducing an embedded, an embedded operating system, even though it's dysfunctional. We have to do both. When we design our projects, we have to understand the, the, the relationship with the operating system and take advantage of every opportunity to shift the operating system in the right direction. It's kind of cool. It's good, yeah. I'm so glad uh, to be alive here seeing this happen compared to where I was in the 80s when I was going to architecture school. It was the opposite. It wasn't just not quite as integrated. It was the opposite of integrated. We were told, you can either, I was told by several professors at different times, you can solve problems of society or you can do good architecture. You cannot do both. We said that out loud on more than one occasion. Yeah. And uh, I'm so thrilled to see that they were wrong. Yeah. And we're trying to change them. We, we're changing. Well, in part, we're being forced to change because of you guys. Thank you, buddy. Uh, this is the game theory part of this. <laughs> Question is, can I get rich, pay off my student loans, pay these crazy housing costs in the Boston area, and send my kids to live? Uh, while even though I'm doing good things, yes, you can, but you have to be very good, and strategic. It's a game theory approach. You have to trick the system. You have to know these things of how the operating system works. You have to know it so well that you are actually able to be one of the few people who makes money building multi-family houses. No. Okay. That's. I think, I think you might have gotten your money today. Okay. Thank you, everyone.